In church planting circles, there's a phrase, it takes three miracles to start a church. I believe that's true. Today I want to tell you some of the miracles that got Columbia Grove started uh, as we look at where we came from, as we look at where we are, and as we look at where we're going. Uh, even though we celebrate 15 years of weekly ministry today, you know, kind of like when you celebrate an anniversary or like a birthday, uh, there's all this preparation up to the wedding day or all this preparation up to the day of your birth, all this time where all the things that will be are in this, just this fragile, delicate state. For our family, as has already been alluded to, um, it, was, it was hearing the call of God while still living in Chicago. I was serving part-time at a Redeemer Lutheran Church in Park Ridge, uh, finishing up an MDiv degree. Didn't, wasn't thinking about church planting at all. I was way into music and songwriting and um, had been in youth ministry for years when um, the pastor I was serving under, Fred Nelson, just a dear friend, he said something to me that just got under my skin, got into my head. Um, I, I don't know if, if, if he knew how profoundly the Holy Spirit would be speaking in that moment, but I know that after he said that phrase, I was never, ever the same. He said, uh, have you ever thought about church planting? And of course, the answer was no. But you know, when the Holy Spirit kind of is leading you, um, Though there can often be a thought that just kind of, when it lands, you just can't shake it. And so I found myself having these really vivid dreams about what a church could be like. Like, what if there was a place where we were really serious about bringing people together and bringing ages and generations together? What if, what if there was a place where we, we, we took the Bible seriously and wanted to, to read it and apply it to our lives. And what if there was a place where the creative arts were flourishing and, and there was a place where, where the, the church was, was active and known in its community for service and that dream just kept churning in my mind. Around the same time, Anita was having similar kinds of dreams and thoughts and and so we, we started to pursue it. We started to talk to some people, some trusted people, some denominational people. And, and we went through assessment and, they, you know, and the church planter experts, they took a good look at our lives and, and much to our surprise said, we think you're wired for this. We think you're supposed to do this. And so we gathered a team of people to pray. And over the next 30 days, three miracles happened. You know, you know, sometimes when you're seeking God, I mean, you, you, you pray, but, but you're also, you know, it's like you're praying with your eyes open. Like you're, you're praying and you're also asking at the same time, Lord, how are you answering this prayer? You're looking for him to move even as you're pursuing opportunity and even as you're just desperate before him for his movement and guidance. Well, over those next 30 days, the first miracle that happened is we made contact with three families, like Don has alluded to. Don Miller, Gail Miller, we don't have all of the families in this picture. I'm, some of these are, these, they go back a little bit. Bob and Sue Floyd, Chad and Denise McCurdy. And, and we started, even from a distance, we started some conversation about what it would be like to start a church in Wenatchee. Strangely enough, this is just an odd thing. Like, <clears throat> I've been the youth pastor in, in Yakima for uh, that point about uh, prior to that point about seven years driven through Wenatchee twice, and yet Wenatchee, the Wenatchee Valley, was strongly on our hearts. So God gathered those those four families. The second uh, second miracle that happened was a miracle of generosity. As we were talking to one of our friends in in Yakima and, and saying, "Hey, we're thinking about." starting a church in Wenatchee, um, said, did you know that we have a house in Wenatchee? Would you like it? <laughs> and, and so because of the generosity of some, of some friends in Yakima, we were given free use of, eight, of 804 Crown Street. Uh, uh, and we had a place to live and a place to get started, a place to initially meet with a ginormous garage that allowed us to have the trailer and have all the little, all little carts and all the little parts of that would be required to, you know, put together uh, the things you'd need for a mobile church. Next miracle happened a, a couple weeks later. By this point, I'm, I'm, 
while I'm serving with the church and I'm finishing up a master's degree, I'm also doing a bunch of specialized church planter training. And I was in Detroit one, uh, one weekend doing some, doing some training, and I ran into Pat Stark. Pat is a longtime youth pastor from the Seattle area, and he was just getting ready to plant a church in the Tucson area of Arizona. Fun fact, did you know that about 15 years ago, uh, Alice Cooper became a Christian? You know, the shock rocker, school's out for summer. You can raise your hands. You're there. You raise your lighters. You can do that. Well, he became a Christian, and that's now his church. So anyways, I was talking to Pat, and he said, I've got a friend in Wenatchee. He's a longtime young life guy. He really loves the Lord. You should really talk to him. Um, he's a teacher, too. And since... Um, like, churches often start in schools. I thought, well, this is the guy I should talk to. He might know who to contact so we could meet. Like, it's maybe even meet in the new junior high that was under construction. So I get an email address, and I shoot off an email, and amazingly enough, he even responds, and, you know, uh, where do you plan to meet, and who do you have, and what's the church about? And I told him about our kind of our, sort of our dream or whatever, and we have four families, you know, we're all, we're all, we're, they almost, except for Bob, we all think we're ready to go, and we all think we're going to go and do something with, with starting a church, and it's going to be awesome, and you wouldn't happen to know who we should contact about meeting in the new junior high that's under construction right now. And I get an email back 10 minutes later. How could you possibly know I'm the right person? And so because of this mutual friend, even before we got started, even before we moved into Chicago, or moved from Chicago to here, um, we had the junior high. We had a place, we had a place to meet. And so in the, the summer of 2003, the four families that gathered and um, in a hotel room in, in Arvada, Colorado, we started to dream and try to put into writing what that kind of a church could be. And this is what that group wrote. We are serious about creative Bible-centered ministry to every generation. We long to see generation and cultural gaps bridge through worship and together bring the compassion and justice of Jesus. To hurting people. We want grandparents, parents, and grandchildren to enjoy each other's faith, with music, and art. We want to be a place where people can ask honest questions and have an honest conversation. We want to be a place where people's talents are given a chance to flourish and grow. We want to be a church that cares more about people than programs or doctrine. A place that's full of fun and fellowship as we grow in faith together. Together. Together together. And so out of that one vision statement, that dream of what it could be like to have a church like that, we got started. Started worshiping in the, the junior high. In the junior high, we also worshiped in tents. Next slide. We held backyard groups and clubs and we did lots and lots and lots of outreach in various places, in schools, from the back of pickup trucks, at the farmer's market. And the church grew little by little by little, 30 people, then 50 people, then 60, then 70, then finally 100. And then and we saw people come to Christ. And we started to see people get baptized and I, I wish I could tell you the exact number because, you know, you don't always keep good records. You know, sometimes you're so deep in, in, the, the, in, the, in, the, in the thick of life that you're not always paying attention. But I, I know it's at least 200 people and at least 400 people that have made some form of a first-time commitment to Jesus and taken significant steps forward in their faith over the last 15 years. And as we've, uh, as we've matured, as a church, I mean, by, by, by the time we got to about year five, we realized that we needed to uh, structure a little bit better. And, and so we came back to some of those same vision statements and, and started to craft it in slightly different ways, the same heart, but starting to organize for mission in some better ways. And now our mission statement is simply put this, we help people become more like Jesus through, and there's our three key words, through worship connection, and service. Or the way we put it now is Columbia Grove is all about doing three and a half things. Here's the three and a half things. Our little bubbles, okay? 
We do worship services, places where people can connect with God. So whether those are large worship gatherings like this or our senior services or our youth group services, we do worship services where people connect with God and one another in worship. We do connection groups. Now, those connection groups can be everything from one-on-one mentoring to you know, some of the, the large women's retreat gatherings and then some of our large youth group gatherings. All sorts of different kinds of connection groups, but places where people are building significant friendships and as they look to grow in faith together through biblical engagement and through sharing life with one another. And thirdly, we help people find places to serve. So whether that's ministry teams inside the church where we're serving one another or the many teams that serve out in the community, so from missions groups to various forms of volunteering in various areas and ways, we want people to know what their gifts and their talents and their passions are and help that to connect with God's mission and work in their life and God's mission and work in the world. And we find that most of the time, people are making the journey from left to right. They come to know Christ and they get connected in a worship service. They come to make some friendships so they've got a posse to support them and help them and to to enable them to grow in a connection group. And then they find somewhere to serve Somehow. The half thing we do is leader development. It's the systems and the structures and the training and the processes for keeping the, helping those other three primary areas to thrive. But let me just talk about some of the ways that those, those first values are getting lived out. See, in worship, you've probably noticed this, but there's, there's I mean, this, the, I'm going to talk about three things, but um, you probably noticed more than that, but in worship, there's, there's at least three things that I hope you notice. One is that we are intentionally biblical. With the possible exception of a day like today where this is more of a state of the union vision, ca- this is not much of a sermon. Um, but we open the Bible together. We believe it's God's word and the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct. So we ask questions like, where is it written? And how goes your walk? We want to apply the timeless word of God to our lives. We're intentionally biblical. We're also intentionally intergenerational. You'll notice that in at least three ways. One is in the music, okay? We are intentional about being, about trying to bring grandparents and grandchildren together in worship. So we're always going to be singing new songs and we're always going to sing some of the old songs. Always. We are intentionally intergenerational. There's some other things you'll, you might notice with that, too. Of, and we're committed to, for example, stuff like moderate volume levels. If you're wondering, back at the sound booth, the magic number is 85. 85 decibels. That's where we're trying to get, which is about the same volume as standing next to a vacuum cleaner. It's the volume where you're going to want to raise your voice a little bit. Raise your voice a little bit to sing out. But where you don't need to yell. It's not like 90 decibels, like you're standing next to a lawnmower, where people can sing out, where you don't need to hand out earplugs at the door, even though I know it can be even more exciting to be in louder worship environments when you're younger and you still have your hearing. (laughs) But the reason we do that, the reason we do that is because we are intentionally, intentionally intergenerational. Uh, on the stage, you will see people ministering everything from, you know, probably age 12, age 13, right on up to it's not your bus- it's nobody's business. <laughs> we are intentionally intergenerational. We see that in our children's ministry. We're, what we're trying to do in children's church is introduce kids to church so that they love church. So with, with children's church and increasingly so in children's church. Back there, they're going to be singing some songs that are age-appropriate, that are super fun, so they can connect with God in worship. They're going to be hearing a basic Bible lesson in an age-appropriate way. And then they're going to divide up into small groups to talk about it and to apply it to their lives. Conversation, through crafts, through games. But it's that same model of we worship, we connect, and we serve. And as our kids get a little bit older and they they kind of graduate out of children's church, somewhere around grade seven, the aim 
that we have is to incorporate kids into the worship life of the church as a whole. We, we're looking to have them serve in the worship team and on the media team and in greeting and in hospitality and prayer and, all, and in teaching children's church. Because what we're trying to do with our teens is to teach them to, to expect to be full participating members of the larger church. And sometimes, admittedly, it can be easier and maybe even kind of appealing to have programs that are just for teens, but I don't want to be a part of, of, of a church that trains our kids in church to not attend church. Because pretty soon they're going to grow up. And, so we, and we want them to grow up having significant relationships with people of other generations, of being used to being in a worship setting where not everything is catered to them. So parents, I ask you to help us out with that. Sometimes that can be a little bit of a hard sell, but that's what we're trying to do because we are intentionally intergenerational, intentionally. And we love the creative arts too. It's not every church where that's part of a worship service, but we do that. <laughs> we, we sing songs, we write songs, we do plays, we do crazy stuff. We have fun, we giggle, we laugh, we make fun of ourselves. We love the creative arts because our God is a creative God. We form connection groups, places that build faith and friendships through biblical engagement and sharing life. If you're part of Columbia Grove, our goal for you is that you would have two or three Christian friends that you could call at two o'clock in the morning and not need to apologize for it. And many of you, I know you've already formed those kinds of friendships, but we long for everyone to have that kind of an opportunity. And that happens when we get into circles rather than rows. When we get to know each other by a first name. When we get to share in each other's lives. So we're serious about connection groups because we want you in the word together. We want you caring for each other because we want you to grow. I, I saw this picture. from This is one of our women's connection groups. I just here, Let me tell you why I love this photo so much. Because it exemplifies a whole bunch of values that we're about. This is one of our Thursday night women's groups. If you look carefully in the picture, you'll see three generations represented in one room. Do you see that? If you look carefully in the picture, you'll see Bibles on people's laps. Do you see that? And if you look really carefully in that room, you'll see that they're actually having a lot of fun together. That's the target. We want people investing in one another's lives as they grow together and support one another in the faith. And we love developing service for, for people to discover and develop their gifts and their talents and their passions so that we can serve one another. We've got various ministry teams in the church. More than 100 people each week serve in various volunteering roles in the church. And yes, it's because we we need the help. Oh my, do we ever need the help? But even more so is we know that peop when people serve, they grow. If you want to get really good in football, get out of the stands and get onto the field. When you serve, you grow. And so we look to provide lots of opportunities to serve, but we recognize that that Service is not just what happens inside the walls of this church. If we're really serving, and if we're really serving well, that service is going to extend out into the community. In fact, we have a motto for that. You might have heard it. It's love like Jesus. Love like Jesus. I love the fact. I love the fact that when, when people hear that phrase now in our valley, they think of Columbia Grove. I love that. That's what we're all about, of helping people to know and experience and have their lives be changed by the love of Jesus. We love it so much, we put it on a hillside. And this is a little side note, but I also love, like, that's, that's our marketing plan, too, by the way. You'll notice that on the material that we put out to, for people to share and, you know, wear The primary message is the mission of the church, not the name of the church. It's the mission of the church. You don't need to attend Columbia Grove to be part of the mission of the church. 
So we're going to share that mission as loudly, as proudly, and as broadly as we possibly can. And I hope that you'll help us do that. Because we believe the world will be a better place as more and more and more people experience the love of Jesus. So we're serious about our mission. Now, in part, just because I just absolutely felt like we had to have a Bible verse in this, um, or we're not really doing church today, I was just, I, I was struck this week by these words from the, the book of Philippians. Is the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Philippi. <laughs> and I just wonder if, uh, you know, as he was writing it, if, I, if he was feeling some of what I feel as I stand before you today. He says, I... I Thank God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That the Apostle Paul, as he was thinking of his beloved church in Philippi, he had hopes and dreams and plans for them and things he longed to see them grow into and step into. And so in the few minutes that I have left this morning, I just wanted to share some of my heart and where I see this thing going and what I'm passionate about. And as long as you'll let me be your pastor, these are the the areas and the ways that that I, I, I plan to lead as I think of our next 15 years, as we move, you know, we just, we just, we're having our quinceanera today. You know, you think about that. In some cultures, this, it's this really significant day because, you know, when you turn 15, that's the beginning of adulthood. You're no longer a child. You are becoming an adult. And as a church, we, we're starting to, we're growing up. And it's a good thing. It's a wonderful, wonderful gift. And so as we grow, I think the mission gets increasingly clarified. And and if I could put what I see in front of us in a single statement, it would be this. That I believe God has called us to be a healthy, mid-sized church that is a launch pad. It is a launch pad for new churches and ministries. The longer I serve in ministry, and this is, this is not because it's the only way to do this. This is just how God, has, how, how God has been directing and speaking to me. I have less and less interest in trying to gather as many people as possible in one place. That's less and less and less the scorecard in my heart. I, I don't think I'm ever going to be a megachurch pastor. I don't really want to be. But... Here, here's, what, here's what matters. It's less about how many people do we gather and more about how many people do we send out. How many people can we build up and send out to do kingdom work in Jesus' name? And as I look back at our last 15 years, I discover that that's what God has been doing in us all along. Linda, would you stand up? <laughs> Linda is an example of what Columbia Grove is all about because Linda discovered her gifts and her talents and she went and she did something about it and now thousands of meals are being served to at-risk kids in the Wenatchee Valley through small miracles. You know I'm going to ask you to do this. Megan, I need you to stand up. Megan is an example of what we are trying to do as a local church. Megan discovered her gifts and talents for ministry, and she discovered she's a really good pastor, but even more so, she is a really terrific Christian counselor. And there is a desperate need in our valley with our at-risk teens and with families. And so she went and she did something about it, and she's doing an outstanding job. And that is what we are all about. Now... They're probably only watching on video right now, but I think of people like Peter Schwick, who is planting a church in Chicago, and they're meeting right now because he interned here. I'm thinking of Mary Gandy, uh, and I see Eric in the back. But Mary, when you watch this on video, I want you to know that we're proud of you. This is what we are about. 
helping people discover their gifts and talents and go out in service. Now, I do believe that we're going to grow because I believe for us to be a really great launch pad, we, need, we do need some momentum. We do need some size. I am looking forward to the day when I, I believe in the next two years, our church is going to overall double in size. That, that a gathering like this will just become a normal thing. We'll have one of these at nine. We'll have one of these at 11. Wouldn't that be great? But that's what we're trying to do so that we can take advantage of the opportunities for ministry that are in our valley. Let let me just illustrate that. How many people here drove more than 15 minutes to attend church today? Put your hands up. Look around the room. Now, one thing that that tells us, because every person that drove more than 15 minutes to come here, they drove past other potential places of worship. That tells me that there is a, there is, on some level, there is a hunger in those neighborhoods for a Columbia Grove style church. So I want us to have our hearts open to how God is leading there. In the next, in the next 10 years, will we be starting a church in Kashmir? Maybe. In El Rondo? Maybe. In Leavenworth? Maybe. Let's see how the Lord leads. But see, I know that my life has been changed through that that same, that worship, connect, serve, vision. As I came to know Jesus and I came to discover who I am in Christ, my life was changed. As people invested in my life, as I connected with other Christians, as people got to know me and had the ability to speak into my life, my life was changed. And as I discovered my gifts and talents, and began to apply them to serve the Lord. My life was changed. And I know for many of you, that's been your story as well. As we connect with Christ, as we connect in Christian friendships and grow in our faith, as we go out to seek to make a difference in Jesus' name through service, our lives, our lives, they get changed. And I am looking forward to seeing that happen in increasing and even greater ways in the future. Because, friends, we're a church that brings people together. We're a church that helps people meet Jesus. We're a church that fosters friendship. Amen? We're a church that loves the Bible. Amen? We're a church that builds people up. Amen? We are a church that sends people out. Amen. Would you stand with me as we pray? God, I just want to thank you. (laughs) Thanks for... Thanks for Fred. And a friend that would speak into my life enough that I could hear your spirit's call. Thank you for dreams in the middle of the night. Thank you for unexplainable consequence or circumstances that bring us to this moment right now. God, thank you for four families who would take a risk on something as scary and precarious as a brand new church. And God, thank you for the hundreds of people that have come to know you for the hundreds of people that have become baptized, for the people that have discovered their gifts and talents and they've taken a step forward in their faith and they've gone to make a difference in the world. Oh God, would you take that vision, would you take that mission and would you multiply it for your glory? God, help each one of us to know what our part is in your work and in your plan. Oh God, give us eyes to see what you're doing in each one of us and and what you're doing in all of us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.